His motorcade was en route from Indianapolis to Anderson, was to only pass through Pendleton. However, in Pendleton, Pendleton Avenue had been purposely barricaded, <laughs> blocking the passage of the motorcade. Just north of the intersection of Pendleton Avenue and State Street was a pickup truck acting as a makeshift campaign platform. Seeing what was happening, Senator Kennedy graciously exited his convertible and jumped on the back of the pickup, and here you see him. He spoke briefly for a few minutes, thanking the assembled crowd of about 150 and asked for their support in his campaign and then moved on. I've got to think, if that would happen today and the president would pull into Pendleton or wherever and there is a pickup truck barricading the way, what on earth do you think would happen? <laughs> Secret Service with guns drawn would be everywhere. CNN and Fox News would be overhead with helicopters. It was a different time, wasn't it? The next day, Kennedy made a second campaign visit to Anderson. He was scheduled to deliver a 12-minute speech at 10 a.m. from the east side of the courthouse. You see the crowd assembled here. I, was, I gave this one other place here a few weeks ago, and a fellow said, hey, I was up on the roof. Look at that. Just look at that. Mark, you were there? Yeah. Do you know, uh, were you on the roof too? No, I was in the crowd. You are in the crowd. All right. Yeah, I'm right. Second over there. Third row. Oh, I see a bald head. Is that you? <laughs> a bald guy can say that. Uh, but as his caravan of three buses and seven cars entered Anderson from the south on Indiana 9 and turned north on Madison Avenue to 8th Street and then to the courthouse, he was... 50 minutes behind schedule. After his welcome to the city by Mayor Ralph Ferguson and introduction by 5th District Congressman J. Edward Roush, Kennedy began speaking around 11 a.m. and spoke for only eight minutes to an estimated crowd of 6,000 spectators. You recognize the east side of the courthouse. Although rushed, he took time to shake numerous hands and sign a few autographs before leaving for Muncie. A word about the photograph. A couple of years ago, former Anderson Mayor Bob Rock contacted the Historical Society and said, uh, I've got a number of items that uh, I would like to donate to the Historical Society from my time as Mayor of Anderson and as Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Indiana. How about coming up and taking a look at them? So the three of us went up there that afternoon. <coughs> we ended up taking everything that he wanted to give us. I wandered around the house and I went down a hallway. Hanging on the wall of the hallway was this photograph. And I said, Bob, could I have a copy of that photograph for the Historical Society? He said, oh, absolutely, that, I'll do that for you. And so he had one made and he gave it to me and he identified the principles and I've labeled them up here, but we'll start here. This is Nelson Bohannon. These are going to be names that are going to be familiar to some of you. John Kirkpatrick, Mayor Rock, this is Bill Seabree, this is Bill Norton, this is J. Edward Roush, this is Mayor Ralph Ferguson, Indiana Governor Matt Welch, and of course John Kennedy. Not a notable in the photograph is a committeeman from Guide who skipped work. <laughs> His name shall remain anonymous, but I know him. Harry S. Truman, what does the S stand for? Yes. Exactly, nothing. Nothing. And I learned something the other day. If it doesn't stand for anything, you do not punctuate it. Eight years earlier, Anderson was visited by Harry S. Truman. The last time a sitting president stopped here and the last time he came to town by railroad. The 33rd president of the United States delivered a speech from the train's rear platform at the New York Central Railroad Depot in Anderson. I heard uh, I was there. How, how many were there? Oh, good. 
and I failed to ask how many were, uh, I know Mark, you said you were at Kennedy. Anybody else? Okay. They dismissed school. Central Junior High School and Emerson High School was up there for that. I was there too. They didn't, they didn't dismiss Madison Heights. <laughs> yeah. So we went. Well, let's, let's back up. Anybody from, anybody here when uh, Obama spoke? How about when uh, Reagan spoke? Bush, Gerald Ford, okay, Kennedy we've covered and now we're down to Harry Truman. It was 8, 10 a.m. on October 9th, 1952 when he delivered a five-minute speech to an estimated 7,500 persons urging their support of the Democratic state ticket. This is one of the controversies that I've run into as county historian. There are a number of people in Anderson that say, oh, I saw him when he came through in 1948. I heard him speak. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I'll explain that here in a minute. He spoke in 1952. At the close of his remarks, he introduced his daughter, Miss Margaret Truman, to the crowd, myself included. Yeah, I was there. Fourth grader at Riley School. My mother and father thought it was important enough for me to go see the President of the United States that they didn't send me to school that morning. Instead, we went uptown, gathered with the crowd around the, the uh, station there till the train pulls in. Dad puts me up on his shoulders because I can't see all over all those people. And I had a great seat and could see Harry Truman. Of course, at nine years old, I didn't know who Harry Truman was, but I sure, sure had a good time. Truman expressed gratification for the large audience and listened to this and regrets that his train did not stop on a similar whistle-stop trip through Anderson during the 1948 campaign. The city was expecting Truman to make a brief rear platform appearance from his train at approximately 1.09 p.m. on October 30th, 1948. However, the large crowd only witnessed the passing through of President Truman's special train. Mrs. Truman and daughter Margaret appeared on the rear platform and waved to the crowd that extended approximately five blocks east of Jackson Street on the New York Central's tracks. The president was in the last car of a 16-coach train and did not get the message of the waiting crowd in the until the train was passing through Anderson. He hurried to the rear platform as soon as he received word and did manage to wave to some of those assembled before the train made its way out of town en route to St. Louis, where he delivered a major speech that night. As I read about it, I found out he's sitting in that last car relaxing and somebody taps him on the shoulder and says, look, here's all these people. And he jumps up and goes out, but the train goes on, so he waves to everybody. He felt bad about that. Warren Harding. When Truman passed through Anderson in 1948, 28 years had elapsed since the last president had stopped in Anderson on November 6, 1920. Now, who was there for that? <laughs> Warren Harding had been elected our nation's 29th president just four days earlier on November the 2nd. A special five-car train taking President-elect Harding and his party to Point Isabel, Texas made a noon stop at the Big Four station in Anderson. Several hundred people had gathered there to greet the next president. Mr. and Mrs. Harding greeted the crowd from the rear platform of their car. There was a great rush to grasp Harding's hand. Mrs. Harding was especially happy and gracious in greeting the people. One local notable in the crowd was the former Indiana governor and Anderson resident Winfield T. Durbin. Recognizing Colonel Durbin, Harding reached over the railing to shake Colonel Durbin's hand and asking, How are you, Colonel? To which Durbin replied, Don't forget to spit on the bait before you throw it in. A reference about a fishing as part of his upcoming recreation. I guess that's good luck, fisherman. <laughs> Makes for a good story anyway, doesn't it? Harding's train left Anderson heading west, but before it left Madison County, there was one more wave by Harding to two boys waiting for him at the Big Four station in Pendleton. Maurice Swain 
and Robert Hardy waited at the station for their chance at history and were not denied as Harding exchanged waves with the two boys as his train passed by. This was not Harding's only visit to Madison County. Seven months earlier, Ohio Senator Harding had been in Anderson as a Republican candidate for the presidential nomination. He arrived in Anderson from Indianapolis just before noon on April 7th, 1920. He was to attend a luncheon in the ordinary of the Grand Hotel given in his honor by Mr. and Mrs. James Larmore, which was a private rather than political. The Grand Hotel was located on the northeast corner of 11th and Main Streets. Today, that's the site of the Anderson Police Station. The Ordinary was the fancy restaurant that was on the first floor of the Grand Hotel. Mr. Larmore had been a warm personal friend for many years. One would assume it was this friendship that brought Harding to Anderson, but there may have been another more personal reason. Nine years earlier, on November 30th, 1911, Harding's father, Dr. George Tryon Harding, Sr., was married in Anderson to a local widow, Mrs. Eudora Kelly Luvisi. The ceremony was performed by Reverend Carlos M. Dinsmore, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church at the time. Before the luncheon, there were individuals scheduled to meet with Senator Harding and one of them had forgotten to show up on time. Now, can you imagine you have an appointment to meet with the candidate for president of the United States and you forget to show up? Well, seizing upon this opportunity, Harding stepped across Main Street to the Elks Block Barbershop at 1025 Main, which would be right in this area. Here's the restaurant, the Grand Hotel. He comes over here, goes into the barbershop. It was around noon when Barber George J. Martin had a man he did not recognize come into the shop for a shave. Quote, he gave me a quarter, the shave was 15 cents, and he told me to keep the dime, close quote, said Martin later. Not long after, Elder C. Love, manager of the Grand Hotel, came across the street to ask who had shaved the man who had just returned to the Grand. Martin replied that it was he, and Love said, do you know you just shaved Warren G. Harding. <laughs> Needless to say, George Martin kept that dime for many years. <laughs> After the luncheon, Harding went to the Starland Theater on Meridian Street. Now, the Starland Theater is just a couple doors down here. It's where Laura Sandlin's insurance agency is now located. Was the Times Theater. Before that, it was Starland Theater. That's a picture of it when it was the Starland Theater. It was here on the afternoon of April 7th that Harding delivered his second campaign speech in Indiana. Senator Harding declined to speak <coughs> from the rostrum on, or stage for the occasion, stating he preferred to speak from the floor and ventured to suggest that if men in public service would meet the people on their level at all times, it might be better for everyone concerned. Harding had one more connection with Madison County that occurred on February 22, 1921. President-elect Harding appointed James J. Davis as Secretary of Labor. The former recorder of Madison County became the first Madison County resident to serve as a presidential cabinet officer. When Warren Harding <coughs> spoke in 1920, a decade had passed since the last president had delivered a speech in the county. However, the preceding decade between 1900 and 1910 witnessed three speeches by men who were former presidents or seeking to become president, Theodore Roosevelt. On October 13, 1910, former President Teddy Roosevelt delivered a speech in Anderson in support of U.S. Senator Albert J. Beveridge's bid for re-election from Indiana. This photograph was taken the morning of that day when uh, that he was in Anderson. It's taken in Indianapolis, and I, I kind of amused by the photograph. The senator's giving him a mouthful, and I don't look, doesn't look to me like Roosevelt's all that interested in what the senator has to say. Daydreaming almost. Roosevelt came to Anderson on a special three-car train from Indianapolis, which arrived at 625 in the evening. 
From the Big Four Station on 15th Street, he walked to a waiting vehicle on Meridian Street, which took him north to 14th Street and one block west of Ziegler, the Ziegler lot. Here, a large speaker stand was assembled on the south side of 14th Street, complete with brilliant lights over, uh, overhead to illuminate the stage for an estimated 10,000 people who, to view the former president as darkness had fallen. As his car approached the stand, the great audience sang the first and last stanzas of America. This is a map I found of uh, our city. Just to illustrate for you, the train would have come into the Big Four station. He got out of the, uh, off the train, walked over here to waiting car, went north on Meridian to 14th, over here on 14th, and came up the alley, and the speaker stand was here. This was known as the Ziegler lot because a Mr. Ziegler who lived here owned that property, and it was a favorite place for speech making. Look at the crowd. That's the morning of the day he was here. This photograph is taken on Monument Circle in Indianapolis, but look at the rush of the crowd. Even though thousands surrounded the stand, there was no delay in getting him through the lane formed by a Rough Rider escort of 80 horses. 80 horses. Once on the stand, the crowd gave Roosevelt a rousing reception with shouts of Teddy. He responded by waving his hat and talking to the crowd on all four sides of the stand. After a 15-minute speech, he was quickly whisked back to his train. There he spoke from the car platform to the crowds around him for over a minute before leaving Anderson. And what I've learned is that as the train was pulling away, he's still talking. He's still talking. <laughs> Roosevelt always had a lot to say. It had been a rousing reception for the former president, but fell far short of those he received when he spoke in Anderson on two previous occasions. However, in between the two Roosevelt speeches was one given by the man who had become, became our 27th president, William Howard Taft. 10,000 people waited in a drizzling rain for two to three hours on October 23, 1908 to hear William Howard Taft, the Republican candidate for the President of the United States. And as the events of that day unfolded, only a few hundred heard him and perhaps not more than a few thousand saw him to any degree of satisfaction. His special train was scheduled to arrive at 4 o'clock and remain for 25 minutes on the Big Four tracks stopping at the Jackson Street crossing. He was to proceed to a platform constructed in the Joe Ziegler vacant lot bordering the north of the, on the north of the Big Four tracks to make his speech. However, his special train was running, already running late when it arrived in Muncie and was further delayed by a long freight train that blocked the track when his train was ready to leave Muncie for Anderson. Taft's train was an hour and a half late when it arrived in Anderson. The engine had to practically stop at the station and trainmen had to walk in front of the engine to get the mass of people off the track. Then as the train proceeded on to its planned stopping point, the surging crowds lined up behind it. When the brakes were set at the east side of Jackson Street, the mass of people were behind the train and crowding towards it. The crowd was said to number in the thousands making any approach to the ropes that led to the arranged platform very difficult. At last minute decision was made to have Taft speak from the rear platform of the train instead of the Ziegler lot. The packed multitude behind the train had made exiting the train difficult. That coupled with the steady rainfall and the lateness of the hour were all factors in making that decision. When his introduction about was about to take place, the thousands that had been gathered for hours about the platform in the Ziegler lot headed towards him. You get the picture? However, in the dusk of the evening, many could not see him on the dark rear platform of the train, nor could they hear him. He was introduced by former Indiana governor and Anderson resident Winfield T. Durbin. The former governor made the following introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, when Harrison was running for the presidency, I had the pleasure of introducing him in Anderson. 
And when McKinley was running for the president, I had the honor of introducing him here. And not long ago, I had the pleasure of introducing the great president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the next president of, to the fellow citizens of the city of Anderson. Think of that. Wouldn't that be an honor to introduce one president? He introduced four. Taft was unaware of the planned arrangements, and after his introduction, he began to speak. His face beamed with good nature and smiles, though his voice was such that he spoke with difficulty owing to the many speeches he had given. Taft's remarks were brief and made to a crowd of supporters who began assembling long before 2 o'clock, and despite the rain, held its place. The Ziegler lot and the street were filled, and likewise all the open space on the big four tracks to the south, Hundreds upon hundreds perched upon the freight cars and the buildings. So his train is parked here, and along here all these people got up, and on the buildings they got up to see Taft. For a long time the crowd was a sea of umbrellas, and any sight whatsoever of the train's platform was out of the question to thousands. Yet all stayed for a chance to see and hear Taft. When he left Anderson, Taft had no knowledge that he had disappointed so many. On October 11, 1900, and again on May 30, 1907, it was a completely different scene as the ever popular Theodore Roosevelt thrilled thousands in Madison County. In all of my research of all of the presidents who've been here, Theodore Roosevelt is by far, was by far, the most popular of all the presidents who've been here in terms of people who turned out to see them. Thousands upon thousands to see Roosevelt. No other president here has enjoyed that kind of popularity as did Theodore Roosevelt. On May 30th, 1907, the Big Four Railroad's Detroit Special train with the president's car, the Magnet, attached and carrying President Theodore Roosevelt stopped in Anderson not once but twice that day. He was on his way to Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis where he was to speak at the unveiling of General Henry W. Lawton Monument. Roosevelt's train arrived on schedule at 9.55 a.m. and stopped for nearly 10 minutes near the Cincinnati Avenue crossing. The president appeared on the, pre on the car's platform where he shook hands and engaged in small talk with hundreds who had gathered to see him. When the train began to move, Roosevelt remained on the platform, waving and bowing to all the people strung out along the track until the train moved west of the Big Four Station between Main and Meridian Streets. On the return trip that evening, his train arrived one minute ahead of schedule at 6.59 and made a scheduled eight-minute stop. Roosevelt was known as a stickler for promptness and insisted upon being on time everywhere he went, and on this day, the railroad complied. That evening, a great crowd estimated that not less than 5,000 packed the area behind his car. Another 5,000 or more were strung out along the tracks from Hazelwood to Columbus Avenue. There were far too many people near his car for all to hear him speak, which resulted in many of them not being able to hear his voice, but satisfied just to see him. His speech lasted only a few minutes, and he was still speaking when the train began to move out. He stopped and waved his hands to the crowd as the train departed the station headed east. Seven years earlier, the city turned out in record numbers to see the man who was the nation's Spanish-American <coughs> War hero. It was October the 11th, 1900, when the New York governor, the then New York governor, Theodore Roosevelt, arrived in Anderson to perhaps the greatest welcome ever seen in Anderson. Roosevelt was President William McKinley's running mate on the Republican ticket. McKinley won the election, however, in less than a year, McKinley would be dead, the victim of an assassin's bullet, and Roosevelt would be the 26th President of the United States. These are some welcome ribbons that were worn the following day when Roosevelt was in Terre Haute. I got my hands on these. The special train carrying Roosevelt to Anderson left Marion, Indiana at 6.30 that morning over the big four tracks. His route brought him through Alexandria, where he spoke around 9 o'clock to a crowd estimated at 8,000 people assembled at the big four station there in Alexandria. Next stop was Anderson. 
His train consisted of two sleepers, a dining car, and a baggage car. Between stops, Roosevelt rested and only occasionally was anyone admitted to his compartment. He brought with him his own cook, who saw that his diet was rigidly followed as outlined by his doctor. On October the 11th was known as Teddy Roosevelt Day in Anderson. A large parade had been formed at 8th and Jackson and in the neighboring streets. It was the longest parade of this campaign and equal of any in recent years. The mile-long procession required 35 minutes to pass a given point. Some pictures out of one of our history books of Roosevelt Day that day. I have some more here in just a minute where I've blown those up and you can see them better. When it was about to begin, an eastbound freight train started to pull out from Anderson's Big Four Station where Roosevelt's train had just arrived. One of the cars jumped the track and it was some time before the car would be put back on again. The derailment caused a delay in the procession for a short time. <coughs> Roosevelt's train arrived in Anderson 10 minutes ahead of scheduled 10.07 a.m. arrival time. He was then taken to the speaker stand which had been erected on the east side of the courthouse in the area then called the Commons. This is our old courthouse. The speaker stand is here on the east step and this whole area at that time was called the Commons. Arriving there earlier than scheduled and coupled with 15 minute delay caused by the long procession in reaching the Commons area, it was decided that though there was limited, though time was limited, it would be better for Roosevelt to wait until the crowd was assembled and had quieted down before he began speaking. He was greeted by prolonged cheering by those who had arrived earlier when he arrived on the stand and acknowledged this by gracious bows in all directions. To the right of the stand, a party of men gave the Rough Rider yell. Roosevelt rose to his feet, lifted his hat, and helped them complete it. While still waiting for the crowd to assemble, some horsemen came in on the commons at a gallop. It was said that the former Rough Rider admired the horsemanship of the riders. At the same time, his eye caught one of the men do a re rather remarkable feat. The fellow was going at gallop when his hat fell off. He turned around instantly and passing it, snatched it from the ground without dismounting. Good, good, shouted Roosevelt. That man's a great rider, he said. Rising to his feet, he saluted the fellow. The audience picked it up and a rousing cheer went forth for the young man. Another incident occurred while Roosevelt waited for the crowd to assemble about the stand. Nine-year-old Sari Schreider was held up in the stand as a, with a beautiful floral tribute. Roosevelt thanked her and then asked, How old are you? She replied, Nine. <coughs> That's just the age of my daughter Ethel. This is Ethel. He then thanked her. You're a nice little girl, and it's very kind of you to remember me with that nice bouquet, and I'll always remember you. Can you imagine that girl growing up, the memory that she had? <coughs> Governor Roosevelt was introduced by Anderson's Charles L. Henry. Roosevelt was in perfect voice. He had a way of hissing out some of his words between those famous teeth of his which was a characteristic of his speaking and a method of emphasis. His speech was delivered to a crowd estimated between 10 and 12,000 with one estimate at 15,000. Here you see the crowd. Regardless of which estimate is correct, it ranks as the largest crowd in Madison County's history to witness a speech by a president, either future, current, or former. After his speech, Roosevelt returned to his train and the horsemen were there waiting. Roosevelt picked out the one he had seen retrieve his hat. He went up to speak with him about his horsemanship displayed on the commons. Taking him by the hand, he said, you're a rough rider, sure enough. I'd like to have had you in my regiment. It was later learned that the young man was Charles Williams, a clerk at Corbett's grocery store on Meridian Street between 10th and 11th, right over here. 
His departure was delayed a half hour by orders from the railroad stating that the train would have to wait for the railroad Southwestern Limited that was running a half hour late. Even the railroads had priority over man running for president. Long after he left Anderson, a large part of the crowd remained in the city throughout the day and mingled in the streets, relishing the time spent with the nation's newest hero. Another large outpouring of support occurred four years earlier when former President Benjamin Harrison was in Anderson, campaigning for William McKinley during the 1896 presidential campaign. It was 10 o'clock on the morning of October 30th, 1896, when a parade consisting of 3,700 marchers passed the Hotel Anderson, located on the west side of Marine Street between 7th and 8th Street. Some of you may remember the old Hotel Anderson. The parade moved south on Marine to 9th Street, where it turned west to Brown. A crowd estimated between 12 and 15,000 gathered around the stand in the Brown Street Park which was bounded, which was bounded uh, between today's 11th and 13th streets in Brown, Delaware, and Lincoln. I found this on an 1896 Sanborn map. This is the park. This would be 11th Street, this would be Brown, Delaware, and this would be 13th Street. Today, of course, that's all a residential area. There was at the base of this park a natural amphitheater that was where Lots of speech making took place. Today, that amphitheater is filled by the wigwam. They heard all he had to say on behalf of McKinley and against his opponent, William Jennings Bryan. It was reported that twice that many thronged the streets and square unwilling to share the pushing and crowding at the park. William McKinley. McKinley, the 25th president, won the election in 1896 and again in 1900. He was in Madison County on at least two occasions prior to becoming president. The first was September the 13th, 1892. Governor McKinley of Ohio was invited to Elwood, Indiana to dedicate the new American sheet and tin plate plant. The day was officially designated as McKinley Day in honor of the man who, due to largely to his efforts when he was a United States Senator from Ohio, passed a bill to create a tariff law which would favor the manufacture and exportation of tin. It was a day of national importance marking the beginning of tin plate in the United States under the new protective tariff. Elwood had over 20,000 visitors that day. Escorted by members of the Indianapolis Columbia Club and the special train carrying McKinley arrived in Elwood about noon during a heavy rainfall that continued throughout the morning and most of the afternoon. In the afternoon, Governor McKinley delivered the principal address of the day in the Elwood Opera House, a change from the uh, grove to the theater being necessitated on the amount of rain, on account of rain. Some of you may be familiar with the Elwood Opera House. I know a gentleman here in the room who broke his leg right about here. You can raise your hand if you want to. <laughs> he was going into the bar, not coming out. I need. <laughs> There's a little balcony right here on the old Elwood Opera House. McKinley spoke from that balcony where it was dry to the thousands in the street where it was pouring rain. Following his speech, McKinley was taken to the tin plate works for an inspection of the plant. It was planned to have him and a small party of distinguished visitors go out in a private rail car, but the crowd following was so large that the engine and car could not get out of the crowd. Finally, the locomotive was uncoupled and the group boarded the train making their way to the plant. At the conclusion of the events, McKinley and his party boarded their special train to carry him back to Ohio. The train used the Panhandle Railroad tracks which passed through Anderson. This is the old Panhandle Depot in Elwood. His train reached Anderson about 6 o'clock in the evening and he stopped at the Main Street crossing of the railroad, which would be, here's Main Street, this is the old Pennsylvania Depot. The train would have come in from Elwood and he would have stopped right here. 
Today, that would be at the intersection of 5th and Main Streets. McKinley stepped out on the rear platform of the train and spoke to the assembled crowd for approximately 15 minutes before continuing on to Ohio. The newspapers of the time reported that McKinley made a second appearance in Anderson in 1894 when he spoke from the rear of a platform of a Big Four train. No further mention of this occasion has been found to establish the date and place, although it is assumed the speech was delivered at the Big Four <coughs> station. Harrison. According to the New York Times, who was reporting on President Benjamin Harrison's trip from Indianapolis to Washington, the 23rd president was in Madison County on October 30th, 1890. The paper reported the day following his visit here, quote, at Pendleton, a brief stop was made and a committee from Anderson, headed by Mr. Winfield T. Durbin, boarded the train. An immense crowd was assembled at Anderson and the president, on being introduced, made a brief speech, close quote. Harrison's stop in Anderson was at the end of a long train trip through the Midwest where he campaigned for Republicans running for Congress during the midterm elections of 1890. He was no stranger to campaign stops in Madison County as he'd been here 14 years before, however, under much different circumstances. In 1876, Harrison had been the Republican candidate for the governor of Indiana. By an odd turn of events, he had received notification of his nomination while on board a train in Fort Wayne. It was around noon on August 5th when Harrison wired a personal friend in Indianapolis, quote, I heard nothing of it at all till my arrival here. I cannot answer without further fuller understanding of the circumstances. We'll be home tonight at 1030 by the B line, close quote. His train was greeted in Muncie by a group of prominent Republicans who acted as an escort during his trip to Indianapolis. The trip was slowed considerably at smaller stations where Harrison waved to the crowd from the train's platform. No doubt this was the case in Anderson. But at Daleville and Pendleton, huge bonfires and great crowds necessitated full stops and brief speeches from the candidate. Two weeks later, Harrison's campaign was in full swing and he again found himself in Anderson where he spoke to a rally on August the 19th. He would lose that campaign that fall to Democrat James D. Williams, but 12 years later would be elected president of the United States. Isn't that ironical? You lose the, the race for governor and 12 years later you're elected president of the United States. Prior to this visit by Harrison, the only known visit by a president, future, current, or former, occurred in Anderson sometime in 1874. Then, Indianapolis attorney Benjamin Harrison had the three-member defense team during the trial of John W. Corwin for the fatal shooting of Colonel Thomas Stilwell during an altercation in Corwin's bank on January 14, 1874. That was on our courthouse square. Mr. Corwin was acquitted of the charges. Eleven men, eight of whom would become future presidents of the United States, and three more who were a combination of future, current, and former have stopped in Madison County, beginning with the earliest Benjamin Harrison in 1874 to the most recent Barack Obama in 2008. Anderson has played host to all 11. Pendleton has witnessed three, Harrison, Harding, and Kennedy. Roosevelt and Kennedy both made speeches in Alexandria, and McKinley was the guest of honor in Elwood. There are two places that have witnessed more of these men than any other in Madison County. The first is the Big Four Railroad Station in Anderson. Theodore Roosevelt was the first in 1900 and again in 1907, then Taft in 1908, Roosevelt in 1910, and Truman in 1952. The Madison County Courthouse has also been witness to three, although two, Kennedy and Roosevelt spoke from the old courthouse and Ford from the current building. Three of them were holding the office of President of the United States of America when they were here. They were Benjamin Harrison in 1890, Theodore Roosevelt in 1907, and Harry Truman in 1952. 
It's my hope that the presidential visit tradition continues in Madison County into the future. It's been a place where one-fourth of those who have gained our nation's highest office have received warm welcomes for well over a century. Thank you so much for your kind attention. <laughs>